All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Hey guys, on the line, I got Kyle Anzalone. He is the news editor at the Libertarian Institute, and he's the opinion editor at antiwar.com. And he writes a bunch of great stuff every day, as well as giving thumbs up and thumbs down on all the great viewpoints we run at antiwar.com. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Kyle? Doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me back on. Very happy to have you here. And if you go to uh, libertarianinstitute.org, and it's on the blog at antiwar.com too, you'll find Kyle's show, Conflicts of Interest, which is co-hosted sometimes by Connor and sometimes by Will and sometimes by, I don't know, guest co-hosts and sometimes by just Kyle. And it's really good. It's way better than my show. You'd really like it. Um, and... Um, so, well, top headline, Russia warns we're closing in on World War III. I don't know. I was told by TV and by uh, expert sources talking to the New York Times that we don't need to worry about that. We can do whatever we want. What do you think, yeah. Kyle? No, this, I, I think we got two really important statements from uh, high-ranking Russian officials. Uh, Lavrov, the foreign minister, uh, said that uh, the war in Ukraine was nearing the point in overturn. And, you know, he's making this statement as Russia is preparing for a major offensive in Ukraine. And Washington is putting out statements like, well, we'll let them fight for a couple more months, but then we're going to push uh, Kiev uh, to negotiate. Well, you know, depending on how things are going on the ground in Ukraine, Russia may not be so interested in negotiating. I think that's what uh, Lavrov is trying to make clear. Also, the Russian uh, ambassador to the UN said that all of Russia's red lines have already been crossed. And so he's, you know, pointed NATO expansion and uh, all the Western military activity right now in Ukraine. Yeah, man. So now the implication there is that the Russians will be in a weaker rather than stronger position after a few more months of this or the other way around. Well, I mean, that certainly seems to, to be the way that this war is going. Uh, and we're even now getting signals from the West that all their uh, arms pledges to Ukraine are going to start either drying up or getting tailored back. Uh, Germany is saying that while Kiev was pledged two battalions of the Leopard 2 tanks, now it, it, they're going to struggle to put together a single battalion. And of course, we know that the uh, 31, the battalion of M1 Abrams tanks, the U.S. said they're going to send to Ukraine, probably won't get there until 2024. Additionally, uh, Lloyd Austin, our Secretary of Defense, uh, after the latest Ukraine Ukraine contact group meeting, this is all the NATO countries getting together talking about Ukraine. Usually they announce uh, more weapons transfers to Ukraine after those meetings. But this time Austin said that they're actually going to focus on getting Ukraine uh, to use less ammunition because they're going through more uh, than the Western countries can produce. And, and that's from the NATO Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg. Yeah. Man, um, well, and you did have, and this, is, <laughs> this is on the front page of antiwar.com right now, um, I guess by Dave, is uh, that even Antony Blinken said that, hey, look, trying for Crimea is a red line. He said that in an interview with Politico, I guess. Um, so that's pretty good. That's the... First wise thing I've heard him say in a year or more. Um, is this, so it is. Uh, talk, I, I go back I, to I, what you said. Say whatever you want, but also add, you know, go back to what you were also saying about, I think, that Washington Post story where they were saying, well, we want him to fight for another couple of months and then, but we want to see him negotiate probably before the summer, something like that. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was just going to add about the blinking comment. There was a recent story from NZZ, which is a, a Swiss outlet that's a German language paper. It's uh, one of the papers of record in Switzerland. And uh, what that outlet reported was that uh, in the White House, there's a split between uh, Blinken and Austin, who kind of want to um, 
I think, you know, start to look at China a little bit more. And then, uh, or actually, I think it was Blinken and uh, Sullivan who want to look at China a little bit more. And then Austin and others who want to stay focused on the Ukraine war and really see a need to punish uh, Putin over Russia. So maybe this is a, a little bit of that split shining through. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, back to that Washington Post story. And Dave wrote this up for antiwar.com uh, earlier this week is, you know, the, the White House is saying that, oh, we, you know, we, we think that they could, Ukraine could gain a little bit more territory. Uh, I think they're thinking that Ukraine could get kind of close to uh, not quite maybe the borders pre-Russian invasion, but close to that. And then they could negotiate and, and you know, hope maybe they think they could negotiate that to those borders. Uh, but again, that's not the way the, the battle lines are currently going in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Well, and talk a little bit more about that, because I guess there's not a massive hammer blow kind of a thing, but there is a slow and steady escalation now by the Russians into northern Donetsk especially, right? Right. Yeah, there, there's a lot of fighting in that particular area. Although from my understanding, uh, essentially across the entire uh, line of conflict now in Ukraine, which which is quite large, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Russians are either in very defensible positions or they're attacking their Ukrainian counterparts, which uh, would, I guess, suggest that if, if an, a Russian offensive were to come, they would they would be well prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, so I'm a little uh, in the dark, and I'm sorry because I've been writing this history book and I'm behind on my current events. That's why you're here. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, a little confused on the context of the Russians saying they're worried about this thing escalating to a uh, war between uh, themselves and NATO? Is it that they think that, or they're claiming that they're doing so well that the Americans are now going to escalate against them? Or they are announcing that they feel like they're being put in a corner where they're going to have to strike, you know, beyond Ukraine into allied states who are supplying them or that kind of thing? Or you Yeah, that so I, I think a lot of the issue for Russia right now and what the ambassador to the UN was referencing was this a particular story in the Washington Post where Ukrainian and I think one American official too uh, confirmed that Ukraine is providing Washington with uh, a list of targets and approximate coordinates and then Washington is helping them, uh, you know, confirm the targets or get better coordinates on the targets uh -huh. and then, you know, Ukraine is using that. And so Russia is saying that at this point uh, it's a direct, you know, war against uh, between the U.S. and Russia yeah. uh, with that level of support. And, and, he, and he even, you know, talked about uh, that Russia does have nuclear weapons. And he says, if you are dealing with the nuclear power and if you are signing the goal of inflicting defeat on to this nuclear power, you should have all the options in mind of our possible responses. And, and so he's, you know, again, Russia is floating a, a nuclear threat here mm -hmm. uh, in, in response to what the U.S. is doing, because they are talking about giving Ukraine longer range uh, missiles here now, too, with about 100 or 200 mile range. And so the Washington is doing the targeting for that. That could uh, lead to some pretty serious strikes. And then, of course, there's also the, the Nord Stream 2 pipelines, which both uh, Lavrov and the uh, Russian ambassador to the U.N. made a point to say that there really needs to be more investigation there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And calling for the Security Council to investigate it and all of that, escalating that. Um yeah, so listen, I mean, the whole thing about the co-belligerent here is so important that, you know, the legal experts, uh, Bruce Fine among them, but many others, too. I mean, in fact, um, just David Sanger, I don't know exactly how to take this confirmation bias, if you like, but David Sanger in the New York Times just reports as flat fact that America is a co-belligerent in this war. That, you know, depending, you know, these are all terms of art and categories, you know, subjective categories in people's minds and interpretations of the law by judicial opinion and that kind of thing, right? But, you know, essentially, if you want to be honest about how the letter of the law reads, uh, America and NATO are co-belligerents in this war, and then we keep finding out, right, that there's more and more intervention even than we thought. They go, well... We're giving them intel, but we're not giving them raw intel. We're just, you know what happens is they'll have some intel and then we'll confirm it for them. 
maybe that kind of, and then we find out that's not true, man. We're giving them the straight dope, the best stuff. And in fact, we're going ahead and t doing the targeting for them. We're finding out now we got CIA and special operations forces on the ground there. Um, and, and then of course the bazillions of dollars worth of weapons that they poured into over the last year. And so under the laws of war, even according to the official New York times version of this thing, if they started hitting at, say, for example, arms depots in Poland or whatever, that would be within their right, I guess. That would be considered a defensive action rather than an offensive one. It'd be a huge escalation. I'm not recommending it, but I'm just saying we've already put them in that position by siding so heavily with their opponent here. According right. to the lawyers to talk to the Times, not, not our friends at antiwar.com. Right. And you also have the, uh, a similar comment from the German foreign minister. And also, I mean, just from Biden last year at this time, he was saying, if we're sending long range missiles, tanks, warplanes to Ukraine, then we're at World War Three with Russia. Well, I mean, we're sending long range missiles. You've pledged to send tanks. And it certainly seems like we're about to, you know, open up the, the uh, Pandora's box and start talking about sending warplanes to Ukraine since the UK has announced they're going to start you training Ukrainian pilots on Western-made warplanes. So why would you train them on those warplanes if, if you don't have intention on transferring those to Kiev in the coming months? Well, you know, I'm trying to come up with a collection of these. Did I ask you to help me with this? Um, I found a, quite a few um, where they're, I think it'll be instructive when we have them all together in a pile where they say, well, we're boiling the frog, we're turning up the heat slowly. Yes, we keep crossing the line, but we keep, we're not really crossing the line, we're just moving the line, and we're moving it slowly, and we're doing, and we, we're getting away with it so far. He hadn't nuked us yet. And there's quite a few of those where, you know, officials say that, geez, you know, we really thought that Putin might react already, and he hasn't, so now we think maybe we can go a little further. And it's just, it reminds me of being a bad kid sneaking out at night, doing up to no good, and I know it. Well, we got away with this. Maybe get away with that. <laughs> they know that they're doing the wrong thing. It's I, I, against Russia, sitting on a pile of H-bombs, acting like they don't know that, or acting like it just can't be. That the consequences of their bullshit would blow up right in their face like it always does, but again, in the future. Yeah, well, I, I mean, we have so many of the same players from the last time it blew up in their face over Ukraine, uh, you know, going back to 2014, where you have, you know, Victoria Newland now orchestrating, I think, a lot of the policy in the White House. If you look at the Seymour Hersh reporting on the Nord Stream uh, bombings, you know, she's a pretty central player in all of that. And she was also a central player in orchestrating the, the 2014 coup. Yeah. And, I mean, hell, they all admitted it right off the bat, even Obama himself. So, yeah, you know, Crimea, that was a reaction to us, you know, helping to transition the government there. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Thanks for admitting that, Mr. President. That that would have never happened. It was never an issue for 24 years. Well, not that it was never an issue, but they had a deal, a, a continuing series of deals uh, to maintain their base at, uh, at Sevastopol there on the Crimean Peninsula. It was never an issue until after the coup government in 2014 threatened to kick them out of there that they decided to seize it, which, again, you know, he even admitted. And it is funny, too, because I, I like the fact, I appreciate the fact that in the case of the Newland phone call with Pyatt and in the case of the uh, famous Gideon Rose interview on the Colbert Report, they both talk about, yeah, we got to hurry. We got to midwife it. We got to glue it. We got to make it stick. We got to, you know, get away with taking Ukraine away from Russia before Russia can have a chance to react and stop it. Because they know that, like, whoa, we're sure are playing with fire here, ain't we? Stephen Colbert says, could they send in troops? And he goes, yeah, they could. <laughs> Like, we're trying to hope they won't. Yeah, well, about 100,000 people been killed since then. More than that. I mean, 14 before the war got much worse a year ago. You know, maybe more than 100,000 since then. And, um, you know, that's them getting away with it. They didn't get away with it. Well, they got away with it, but 
a whole bunch of other people, you know, had to pay their hell. That's what happened. Yeah, no, I, I I think we are probably talking about well into the hundreds of thousands, especially since 2014 now in Ukraine. There's a pretty good article by Bradley Delvin in the American Conservatives this week uh, titled Counting the Ukraine War Dead or, or something along the, those lines oh, yeah. where he goes into like, this is what the Ukraine government says. This is what Russia says. This is what the U.S. says. And, you know, it. It, it, there's definitely no number that you could point to and say, oh, that one's the right one. But, you know, with all the estimates, you, you get a good idea that it's definitely in the well into the hundreds of thousands for Ukraine and, and in the tens of thousands for Russia at the very least. Yeah, that's really too bad. And you, you hear fanciful numbers of Russians killed from Ukrainian government sources all the time. But as you say, yeah, it still must be tens of thousands. At the right. very least, you know. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Well, well, let's see. I have. Um, oh, you know what? Let me ask you about this, man. This is important. It's a little bit offbeat, but it is a big deal, which is this train derailment. And I see that you intervened Misty Winston, our good friend from the Free Assange movement, about it. She must have known a thing or two for you to have her on. So I wonder what you learned there. Yeah. So Misty, uh, is a, you know, a citizen and activist in Ohio. So she was, you know, on this story from the very beginning. And, uh, I, I just had her on to kind of talk about, you know, everything that had been going on up until that time she went through, uh, that we have the initial derailment and then, uh, authorities decide to set it on fire. One of the main uh, chemicals that, you know, we know for sure was a part of, I think, you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of this particular chemical, uh, the, the, that's used to make PVC pipes. They know it causes li liver cancer and stuff like that. So that was all burned off. Um, now there is some, and, and, you know, I don't even think just government sources, but people say that, look, if you let this stuff seep into the soil, then the area is ruined forever. So burning it off w was kind of the only option at that point. Now, it's since come out that those cars, I guess, weren't labeled as hazardous material. And so that led to some of the confusion and some of the problems after the initial derailment that I, I don't know if authorities really understood what they were dealing with uh, once that derailment happened. But the police ended up uh, setting it on fire. And, of course, you know, then we get the visual images of this, you know, massive cloud of black smoke over, you know, this town. And, of course, uh, the name of the town is East Palestine. So the only reason I kind of initially even clicked on the hashtag on Twitter is because I was like, oh, East Palestine, what's what's happening here? Where's, uh, you know, where's Tel Aviv carrying out another raid? And, and you know, here it is actually in Ohio, middle America, uh, that this really serious event is happening. Now, the EPA and the rail line are saying that, oh, you know, the chemical levels aren't that bad now. I think they offer people like $1,000. Uh, who are forced to evacuate their homes. Uh, but, it, it, you know, if you're looking at the, uh, like all the, just the independent reporting, people who are actually going to the town, uh, you know, people are getting sick. They have rashes break out. Their eyes are red, burning. Their uh, throat is burning. Uh, I, I saw a video of somebody who was, you know, like a, with the little creek or stream near the incident. And they were showing how when you disturb the water, all of this, like, you know, uh, I don't know. It looks like some kind of fuel or oil in the water is coming up to the top. So uh, there's certainly a lot going on there that needs to be addressed. And it seems that the uh, U.S. government is looking to cover it up and move on from it pretty quickly. Yeah. Sorry. Hang on just one second. Hey, y'all. Scott Horton here for Tennessee Hot Sauce Company. Man, this stuff is so good. They get all different flavors. Garlic habanero, honey habanero, pineapple habanero, Poblano Jalapeno, and the Blood Orange Ghost. They're all so good, I swear. And for a limited time, Tennessee Hot Sauce Company is featuring official Scott Horton Hotter Than the Sun thermonuclear hot sauce. It's full of Carolina Reapers, Scorpion Peppers, Dr. Pepper, Hydrogen Isotopes, and all kinds of things that'll burn your tongue clean off. Seriously, it's really good. Get yourself a hot sauce subscription. Spend $40 or more and use promo code SCOTT to get a free bottle of Hotter Than The Sun hot sauce. That's tnhotsauceco.com. Hey, y'all got to check out these awesome busts of our hero, the great Ron Paul. They're made by the renowned sculptor Rick Casali. 
They're 13 inches tall, hand-painted bronze resin based on Casale's brilliant original. Y'all may have seen mine in the background on my bookshelf in some recent interviews. The thing is unbelievable. Check out this incredible piece of art at rickcasale.com slash Paul, and you'll see what I mean. Use promo code Horton and you'll save 25 bucks, and this show will get a little kickback too. That's rickcasale.com slash Paul. Casale is C-A-S-A-L-I. rickcasale.com slash Paul. And there's free shipping too. You know, um... I saw a thing that showed this train coming down some rickety old tracks. And, oh, it was Dan McAdams retweeted it. So let's send another billion to Ukraine. And so these uh, just rickety old tracks through Ohio, and they were talking about how it's a miracle that any train can make it from point A to B in Ohio without driving off the damn tracks and ruining everything. And in fact, I think I saw they had another, I think it was in Ohio, had another derailment, only this time apparently nothing exploded or anything. There's uh, a there's been a couple incidents in the past week. There was a derailment, I believe, in Houston and another one somewhere in, in South Carolina or Georgia. And then there is another incident where uh, I think a tractor trailer carrying some kind of hazardous material overturned in uh, Tucson, Arizona. It looked like it was spewing some very very toxic fumes it was like a greenish orange color it, it that was really disturbing then there's a a big plant that burned in florida like a five acre plant all plastics yeah. uh so there's a there's a lot of problems in the u.s and, and we're sending a lot of money away you know i'm looking for silver linings man it's kind of like the ukraine war saved us from covid it wasn't omicron right it was the ukraine all the liberal media were finally able to change the subject to the next emergency. It's like, ah, oh, thank goodness. And I know the, the liberal media is not going to take this up as too much of a hobby horse, but it seems like when you have this many kind of undeniable catastrophes in a row like this, it really, you know, it's just like, where's the National Guard when Hurricane Katrina is drowning New Orleans? And everybody knows where the National Guard is. W. Bush has them 7,000 miles away is where they are, you know, out killing people in Iraq for no good reason. And it's things like that that break the narrative, just, you know, events changing things in a way that, um, you know, could be beneficial in the sense of like, well, you can hear the speeches now, right? Just like with Dan McAdams' quote. When you look at this railway that looks like it was built in the 1940s, maybe, and last maintained, maybe then, and while we're waging this world empire, our country's falling apart. It just makes it clear. It's kind of undeniable. And it's not just me. I'm an anti-government guy. But isn't it clear how little the rulers of this country care about us? meaning the very wealthiest corporate chieftains and, you know, their government that they own up there. They don't give a damn about us, man. And and same for TV. You know, everybody noticed how little TV was covering this accident. But the accident was big enough that everybody knew about it. So the cover-up just made it worse. Because it was like, geez, what's the conflict of interest on every TV channel to keep them from wanting to cover. What a sensational story. It's got a big fireball and everything. You know, people love fireballs. <laughs> and still, they don't want to sell dish soap during fireball footage this time. It's because they have a conflict of interest and everybody can smell it and everybody can see it. It makes it helps, I think, to undermine confidence in the regime. I hope so. You know, and, and especially... For example, in their current foreign policy, what are we doing spending all this money on a war east of Eastern Europe when our own infrastructure is such garbage and everyone knows it, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, something else Misty pointed out on, on my show was, and, and this was, I, I think, more of a Democrat issue, so I didn't pay attention to it, but there was a railway worker strike uh, over the winter, and Congress and, and Biden actually forced them back to, to work and, without addressing all of their security or uh, safety concerns. And so, you know, she was kind of pointing toward to that as one of the reasons that we don't see a lot of the Bernie Sanders AOC types really picking up this issue and trying mm -hmm. to make a big deal out of it, uh, because 
you know, they they are partly responsible for what happened here. And so they're trying to downplay it. Now, uh, our our mutual friend, Reed Coverdale, also had a funny theory that he posted on Twitter, which is that, you know, the mainstream media is so conditioned to ignore the existence of Palestine that even when the, the Palestine is in middle America, they'll still pretend like it's not happening. Right. Yeah, I dig that, too. Actually, I could see that as sort of being part of it, that it does sort of conflict with the narrative which is that there's no such thing as palestine and there never was so this palestine ohio why it must be named after palestine texas which isn't named after anything (laughs) because otherwise that's israel over there and it always has been before that it was a land without people and not even a name it was called the trans jordan maybe (laughs) you know it was called the ottoman empire and, which is such a thin excuse. It's so funny. And, and Zionists will say this all the time, too. There never was a nation state called Palestine. Yeah, so there was an area called that just because it was under the political domination of one other, you know, far flung faction or another from time to time doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything as far as the rights of the civilian population there to their own land and their own lives. What a joke. But they say that. And so, look, I think there is something to that. We don't want to talk about Palestine this or Palestine that. There's no such thing. There never was. That's the narrative, and they're sticking to it. Right. I guess you could imagine, too, with the way that uh, search engines work and Twitter search words that, you know, somebody is searching like disaster in Palestine and happens to see some videos of some Arabs getting beaten up, too, or something, uh, right. you know, that that might not play well. Yeah. Well, you know what? In the near term future, there's a good idea for all the algorithm tweakers over there at Google. They just make sure that anybody searches up anybody exploding in Palestine. You just show us this old train wreck from Ohio, this one off and right. we'll forget all about it. I mean, that's a good one. I was kind of thinking about that. There's probably a difference between like the long-term Google SEO and like the short-term Twitter search boost where, mm-hmm. where the, if you, you know, scroll through 10, 15 videos on Twitter, you'll probably end up, if you just search Palestine, you'll get one of a natural pol- you know, Palestinian, something happening in Palestine, not, mm-hmm. you know, in Ohio. Uh, where long term with, with Google or something, maybe now when you search Palestine, the top three or four results are going to be this. And, and then you'll finally get into things, you know, happening in, in Palestine, in the Middle East. Yeah. Seriously, man. All right. That shit pisses me off. Uh, we could talk all about that. Let's not. Let's talk about the balloons. I'm terrified of Chinese balloons. They could have an EMP and and turn out the electricity and then we'll all die and new Gingrich will be rich. What do you think? Yeah. So I always judge, you know, when something's real important, if I have like a family member or a close friend who gives me a call, cause they know I'm really into foreign policy stuff, even if they don't, you know, know all my actual beliefs. And they always, I saw this on TV. How big of a deal is this? And I got a couple of those in relation to the balloon story. People were really afraid that the balloon was going to fly over their house and, you know, chemical weapons, biological weapons, a nuclear weapon, an EMP, something was going to happen with this Chinese balloon uh, that was going to cause a real problem. They don't even know for sure whether we're at war with China or not or what. But this is like what what was the the conversation the, the politicians were suggesting that this could be the case, and yeah. of course, how much of a you know crisis the the Biden administration even allowed this to become by shooting it down with an F twenty two, I think only confirmed a lot of the bias, right? Where you know if you're if if it's not a weapon, then why did you destroy it with an F twenty two? Right. And so th- that yeah, was the first he was one, humiliated, but humiliated, right? Because the the Republicans were calling it a weapon. Or something. <laughs> but then, I yeah, mean, they admit three... now, right, that they tracked it all the way from the time that it took off. They yep. knew it was a weather balloon all along, and they knew that it was a weather weather system, as the Chinese said, yeah. that blew the balloon the course it went on. Yeah. So they they knew that that wasn't what China meant to do with that balloon. And so the the initial Chinese story that this was a weather balloon uh, does seem to to be consistent well, with now, what has happened. Well, now, but what about happened. the size of it? Because they say that, nah, the solar panel and the antenna array on it and whatever was way bigger and different than what you'd expect to see. I, I, I mean, 
maybe China wanted to really advance weather balloon. I, I don't know about their weather balloon projects and everything like that. I mean, and they course, said it had antenna on it. Oh, antenna, huh? What are they going to do with that? Shoot a ray at you or something? An antenna is for receiving signals. So, you know, Kennedy interrupted me. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. Kennedy interrupted me the other day before I got a chance to say on her show that, like, worst case scenario, they're, like, hunting for Chinese dissidents to kidnap and take home the way the Saudis do, right? Something like that. That'd be like the worst thing I could think of that they're trying to do, like a dual use thing. They There's no reason to think they had sophisticated cameras on them. You know, they're over Montana, so everybody just assumes that they're looking at Minutemen missiles, something like that. But then apparently, if I'm reading the post right, for I remember what they said, didn't even have cameras on it. It's had an antenna on the bottom of the thing. Is that correct? So that's my understanding. Now, the FBI says they're doing an investigation, but they've only recovered part of the balloon anyway. So who knows what they're going to turn up and what they're going to say. But, you know, from the very beginning, even the Pentagon was saying, look, you know, China has uh, satellites that do far more advanced surveillance than this balloon ever could. So whatever they're getting would be redundant and unnecessary, which, again, why would China use a surveillance balloon over the United States? I mean, I could see, you know, maybe China testing this over the Philippines or, or a different country like that. They really want a surveillance balloon. But, you know, they're, they're going to send a surveillance balloon over the United States for for information that they already have. It just, you know, doesn't make any sense here. And, of course, the U.S. used this to taint Todd's Blinken was supposed to go to China the the week that that balloon uh, was first spotted over Montana. Of course, you know, that wasn't actually the first time it was spotted because, as you you mentioned, they tracked it from the time it was launched to the time it ended up in Montana and all the way to the Atlantic coast where they shot it down. But, um, you know, Blinken was supposed to go to China and meet with the foreign minister and potentially the Chinese leader, and he canceled that trip. And then after the U.S. shot down the, the spy balloon, Austin tried to call the Chinese uh, foreign uh, defense minister, and he didn't pick up the hotline phone. And then you have Eli Ratner, Austin, and the rest of, of the Biden foreign policy team going, I don't know how we could deal with the Chinese. They're making this situation so dangerous they won't pick up the hotline phone. Yeah. Man, what a disaster. Um, You know, I'm most interested in the social psychological type aspect of the thing and the unwillingness of the American people to learn to even be the slightest bit skeptical about this stuff. They just come and jerk people's chain. And, you know, even after the first balloon, then it was like, more balloons? Oh, my God, it's a thing. And like, no. You know, it's just zero times five, still zero. Chill out. And well, uh, did uh, did you see Dave DeCamps, uh, uh, top story at antiwar.com yeah. today? The Drunken US hobbyists, shot- you know, <laughs> they call them it was the beer league of balloon hobbyists. You know, these guys who go and get drunk on a Sunday. You can imagine Hank Hill and the guys getting into this on an episode, you know, and going setting some weather balloons up there. I'll tell you right, what, well, they go way up there. Yeah, I mean, they could have shot down Bill Dotree, but I remember <laughs> that episode where they tie, where Dale ties Bill to the weather balloon. I just saw yesterday. Yeah, so, dude, yeah. he was up there for days, the poor guy. Yeah, but this group is called NIB, right? And, and you know, it's a it's just a hobbyist group that gets together. It, the size of this balloon, Scott, it's not that much bigger than a large birthday balloon that, you know, the, the $15, $20 ones you would buy for a kid for their birthday at the the checkout line at the grocery store. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's a little bit bigger than that, but not by much. And then at, at one of these balloons, they fired a, a sidewinder missile, a heat seeking missile at it, but the balloon wasn't hot. I, you know, I was, I was having a conversation with somebody about this and it's like, if, if you were letting a 13 year old decide how you were going to shoot down a balloon, they would say, well, what's the most advanced weapon we have? And they say, <laughs> well, it's a sidewinder missile. And they say, well, that sounds really cool. Let's do that. Yep. Right. It, but you would assume that if you want to like shoot it down in a way that any of it would be salvageable, you would just fire the Gatling gun at it or something. Why would you use a missile to hit an object so small? And of course, the fact that nobody apparently looked at it in infrared to notice it wasn't hot and wouldn't be targeted by the heat seeking yeah. missile. And why would it be is, hot? Yeah. In right. fact, I read a thing that said they did shoot at it with the machine gun and couldn't hit it. Oh, that's embarrassing too. Yeah. I so mean, it must have been very small. 
Yeah, what a ridiculous hoax, man. My goodness. And you know, think about you really all could the have a war. You could have look with the heightened tensions between America and Russia and America and China right now. You could have some goofball thing like this lead to a real war. You know, where because what happens, I mean, you never know exactly what's going on, but everybody's just an emotional individual over there, right? So you and and if you look back at history, you have things where you learn later that when our side did this, their side, like for one example, when America did Iraq War One, the Chinese said, Whoa, man, look at their missiles can fly down chimneys and in windows and stuff like that. We really need a revolution in military affairs now. And started a whole new build up then. And we didn't really know until later that that was the cause or that was a major turning point as someone inside the Chinese military said, we can't let this disparity stand at this ratio. We've got to do something. Whereas before they weren't saying that, or maybe they were saying that, but they weren't winning the argument. And then after HW Bush went and had his little adventure playing with his toys in the sand, as Carlin said, then that led to this change of policy, uh, in a, very substantive and terrible way in China, that kind of thing. That's the same kind of thing here where, you know, we don't know what conversations are going on behind the scenes in the Kremlin and inside the Russian military establishment inside the PLA about what their posture is compared to the Americans. I think Putin was just mumbling the other day about, or I guess back in December, about, well, maybe we will change our no first strike posture to, well, sometimes first strike posture if we feel like we have to, which is the American policy. And that wasn't their policy before, but he's like, yeah, I'm having my guys write up a new paper on it right now. You know, these changes are being made. So, and misunderstandings are likely. So yeah. it's just such a reckless thing for them to be putting us in this position this way, you know? And just think about how quickly the American people could be rallied to war, especially against China, if apparently we shot down four objects, three of which were probably, you know, American privately launched either research or just recreational balloons and then one Chinese weather balloon. And the American people are ready to go to war with Beijing over this and believe that they've been attacked and, and China was preparing for potentially, you know, a nuclear strike or an EMP strike to disable the entirety of, of middle America. I, I mean, you know, the, I, that's the scary part to me. Also, the, the fact that the U.S. government now is so reactionary, they're going to start file, firing heat-seeking missiles over American soil at small balloons because of some bad press about a weather balloon that floated over. I, I mean, you, you know, th this is really concerning uh, about the political state of America. Seriously, they're lucky they didn't kill a couple of Polish farmers with that misfire, you know? Yeah. Man. All right. Well, listen— if we're not all exploded to death by then, um, I'll talk to you again soon, Kyle. Thanks very much for your time on the show. Hell yeah. Thanks for having me on, Scott. All right, you guys. That's the great Kyle Anzalone. Man, he does such great work. I hope you guys sign up for his podcast and read all he writes in the news section at the Libertarian Institute. And uh, check him out also. You know, all that stuff runs also at antiwar.com, where he is the opinion editor. The Scott Horton Show, Antiwar Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.